Welcome to Beyond the Crucible. I'm your co-host, Gary Schneeberger, and uh, you are in for a uh, moving and meaningful discussion here uh, as we talk about those moments in life which we call crucible experiences. They are um, painful, they can be devastating, they can be crushing, they can be shattering, uh, they can be failures, setbacks, uh, tragedies, traumas, but there are things that happen to us or things that, that our own actions sometimes can cause to happen that are difficult to deal with. They change the course of your life. They feel sometimes like they stop your heart because they can be so, so painful and life altering. But we are here not to dwell on those things, not to focus on or to wallow in or, or focus on the bad parts of those, but to process them and offer, share hope and healing with each other about how those situations can be moved beyond, beyond the crucible. They can be moved beyond and they can help you chart a course to a life of significance. And our captain, if you will, on charting that course to a life of significance is Warwick Fairfax, the founder of Crucible Leadership. Warwick, it's, uh, it's pretty exciting to be here for the, the, our first interview episode of Beyond the Crucible. Absolutely, Gary. Well, thank you so much. And uh, Esther, it's an honor, really a privilege to have you. Uh, you have such a compelling story of what you've been through, but uh, how you've bounced back and got beyond it is... Uh, is quite remarkable, uh, somewhat of a miracle, I'd say, and um, you know where miracles come from. So um, uh, just in, in sharing your story, um, on Beyond the Crucible, we're really all about, as Gary said, just um, understanding those crucible moments. It could be a failure, setback, your fault, not your fault. It's typically searing, life-altering, who you uh, are now is typically different than who you were before. And part of the healing process, at least for me, is, uh, and for us, is really trying to lead a life of significance, a life that's on purpose, that's helping others, using your pain, in a sense, um, to help others. But um, really a great place to start, with, uh, because many would know your story, but some might. And just tell us a bit about your story and uh, your uh, crucible experience, if you will. Sure. Well, thank you for having me on. It is a great honor to be a guest of yours. And um, certainly, I think we have a lot in common, actually, even though we grew up on opposite sides of the world. <laughs> yeah. and, but, and, and Esther, let me set you up just a little bit on that, because first and full disclosure, you and I know each other. You and I have known each other for 10 years. And um, uh, we are friends. We are good friends. And um, I could probably read your biography off the top of my head. But um, you probably our, wrote it. You yeah. probably wrote it. <laughs> for, so, and, and I do remember stuff I write. But for our listeners, let me just kind of give you the introduction that you deserve here so that they can understand kind of your story and where you're coming from. And then you can uh, you know, take it from there. But Esther Fleece Allen's success and influence as a millennial leader have come not only courtesy of professional acumen, but personal experience. It is through the tragedies and triumphs of her own life, some of which she has shared as a highly sought after international speaker, that she has established authority and authenticity with people from all walks of life. She shared those experiences in greater depth than ever before in her first book, No More Faking Fine, in the hope that readers would apply the events and learnings of her life to their own disappointments and injuries, resulting in new hope, healing, and health. Her new book, Your New Name, Saying Goodbye to Labels That Limit, is coming from Zondervan in January. This is from the back of the book. The important ground it covers that too often our identity gets tangled up with our circumstances. And suddenly, the truth of who we are is colored by our relationship status, our job title, the shame of our past, or what others say about us. Well, I appreciate that intro, Gary, and it really is an honor to be here with you both today. Um, goodness, I mean, uh, where to start? I mean, I really love the concept of this podcast and your leadership, Warwick, just to say that there are crucible moments because we've all had them. We've all had disappointments and setbacks and failures. We've all had things happen to us that have altered the course of our life. 
and probably all of us have made decisions, not always the best decisions that have altered the course of our life. So it's a little tricky for me to kind of hone in on one crucible moment, but um, I will share just a little bit of my past in that um, I grew up in a suburb of Detroit, Michigan, and I had a mother and father and a younger brother and everything on the outside looked fine. Everything looked good. I mean, my father had a successful business. He was actually, um, he was a business owner and they had like a wrecking company, which is more than ironic because he <laughs> ended up kind of wrecking my life. But he had a wrecking company that was very profitable. And my mother was like a volunteer mom at the school and the church. And I just, from the outside, everything looked fine. Uh, but my father did have a mental illness that began showing up more and more as I got older. And I started noticing the physical fights between them. And, uh, it just, it, it just was almost, it felt like as a child that my normal was changing very quickly, but I didn't know how to process that of course. And I didn't know that it wasn't normal because, um, being in a home of domestic violence was my normal. Uh, so the crucible moment that really was life shattering for me was I found myself in a courtroom at the age of 10 years old. And I was called as a witness um, during a case where my uh, mother and father were on opposite sides of the aisle. And that was hard enough, but I was actually quarantined. So I didn't know what the case was about. Um, I didn't know why I was there. And of course, just as a young girl, I felt like very scared. You know, maybe I did something wrong. And I had, even at that age, I had a respect for authority. I was taught to respect authority. And I was a good kid. I was a good girl. And uh, so I found myself, I was escorted into the courtroom. I was walked down the aisle. Well, I, I was escorted by a police officer and had to sit up on the witness stand. And it turned out that my father was calling me to be a witness on this criminal case. And during the, the question asking, he ended up taking out my diary and, you know, there was nothing in my diary as a 10 year old girl that would have helped this case at all. Uh, but he, you know, he, he, and, uh, his lawyer took out my diary. They brought it up to the witness stand and asked that I start reading out of it. Mm. And I just, I honestly, I broke down. It felt like such a violation at that moment. I knew my father had stolen my diary because I knew that I didn't give it to him. And I knew that I wouldn't ever read what I wrote in there. You know, it's probably boy crushes that I had. I would never read that out loud. And so in that moment, I felt such shame and such humiliation, um, especially from somebody that was supposed to be a protector to me. Um, and the judge stood up. And in a moment, I really needed comfort. You know, I needed a defense attorney at that moment. Uh, the judge stood up and, and looked at me and said, you need to suck it up. Mm. And I, I just, I couldn't even register what was happening. Truthfully, like I really blocked out a lot of the memories of the rest of the proceedings. Um, because all I knew was here's an authority figure telling me to suck up my pain, telling me not to cry, telling me to move on, telling me to get over it, minimizing it. And then I have my two parents on opposite sides of the aisle and none, none of them are coming to my rescue. None of them are intervening. One of them is causing me this pain. And it was in that moment that I thought strength was sucking it up and faking fine and acting like nothing is ever wrong. And I lived that way for the next two decades. I just thought, you know, even as I found myself in a church, I thought I'm supposed to be happy all the time. I'm supposed to, you know, give thanks all the time. And I can't let people know what's really going on inside of me. So that, that was a real defining moment for me. Wow. So you said somehow this really shaped the next two decades. Um, can you tell us a bit more about, I know it's probably a long story about your parents and, uh, there's obviously a lot of pain there because it sounds like they were forcing you to choose. Did you feel like a, yeah. a, a pawn in this, I don't want to say game, but almost game between the two of them and yeah. let's see who's going to win often seems like divorce is about, you know, winning and losing and not always about the kids and, you know. Oh, it was, yeah, it was heartbreaking. And I mean, that was just the first of years and years and years of more destruction, more devastation 
my father right after that actually did go to jail and he was in and out of jail for several years. Um, my biological mother ended up getting remarried just uh, shortly after that. Um, and so they were married for just a year and then he had an affair and left our family. And that was devastating to me because, you know, I was kind of just starting to open up to another man, like just another father mm -hmm. figure, like, well, maybe, maybe all men aren't bad. Maybe you know, I'm in middle mm -hmm. school, you know, so mm -hmm. I'm just starting to open up. And then I was actually the one who found out he had an affair. And mm -hmm. so then she got really upset with me. She ended up leaving me in my teenage years. So I found myself orphaned by the time I was a teenager and there were wonderful families in my community. I was in a public school setting and there were just wonderful families that knew I was endangered and knew that I, I mean, there were times I would go home and the locks would be changed. And so I would spend the night with different coaches. I would spend the night with different friends. Um, there was just many times I didn't know where I would ever sleep. Um, I had to pay for everything. I had to buy my own groceries. So I've been financially independent since I was 13 years old. And so then, of course, I had to start working. And so I went from playing three varsity sports after school to working jobs until midnight and 1 a.m. at different golf courses and fitness centers and I would have random people drive me home. Somehow God protected me in all of that. And somehow the community came around me so that I didn't have to go into the foster care system, thankfully. But no, I mean, it was very, very difficult the years following. But when you looked at my life from the outside, you would see the accolades. You would see that I was class president. I was class president from sixth grade all the way to college. Every year I ran for class president and my friends supported me. And so I loved being a leader. I loved influencing people for the positive. I loved pulling out the best in other people. Uh, I've always been a positive, optimistic person. I've always been social. And so you would look at my life from the outside and you would have seen it all together. But really I was sucking it up because I didn't know that I could, I could let people into what was really going on. I mean, how could you be so positive? Uh amidst such horrific experiences. I mean, were you even with either parent or were you with like grandparents or friends? I mean, no, I was with yeah, other people in my community, different friends, even to this day, one of my best friends from high school, I call yeah. her mom and dad, mom and dad. Um, yeah. So no, I was completely abandoned by my biological family and still to this day in my late thirties have no relationship, unfortunately with them. Hmm. It's very interesting, Esther, um, hearing you talk about your story in this way and, and what Warwick has talked about in his story and how he sort of laid out the model of crucible leadership. And I want the listeners to catch this. A lot of times when, when we talk about your crucible moment and what happens afterward, um, we'll say that you have kind of two choices you can make. You can, you can wallow in it. You can, um, you can not get over it. You can believe those things that were said about you and kind of be off track or you can learn the lessons of it and you can use those to craft a vision, set a reality and, and you know, figure out how you're designed. You're talking in some ways about what's maybe a third door. You didn't wallow and, and you didn't move ahead necessarily um, healthily, but you perhaps overachieved your way through burying the pain. Is that accurate? Yeah, sure. I mean, I didn't want to be a statistic. I mean, I was, I was intelligent and I would hear the statistics of girls whose fathers left and how many of them got pregnant and how many of them were, you know, then teen, teenage moms. And then of course, at that time, MTV is airing shows kind of glamorizing that. And I just, I didn't want to be a statistic. I, I didn't, I, I, I didn't want to be what people expected me to be. And so I did, I overachieved, but I will say that, um, there's, there's a, there's a grace sometimes for us to overachieve um, and even whatever our coping mechanism is. All of us have different coping mechanisms. Some of them are, well, most of them are not healthy. Some of them are very damaging and very destructive. But I think all of us have some form of coping mechanism. Some go to alcohol, some go to sports and athletics. Um, but I will say that I feel in my own experience, God loved me enough to stop letting me live out of unhealthy coping mechanisms. So I lived that way for two decades, stuffing my pain, mm -hmm. not letting people know what was really going on. Um, and then after two decades that came crashing down 
And it felt like I was falling apart all over again. And it felt like I wasn't going to recover, but it was actually one of the most kind things God did to me because at that time he said, you don't have to live this way anymore. You can live in, in a way of health. You can be completely you and be accepted for who you are and you don't have to pretend anymore. And so it was really kind of a 10 year journey of relearning how to be me. Mm -hmm. Um, and giving myself that permission, that's where my first book was birthed out of. Um, and, and hopefully where I'm challenging others is like, you don't have to stay that way. Whatever your coping mechanism was because of that crucible moment, even if it's been two decades, you don't have to stay that way. It is never too late to change. It's never too late to be made new. It was remarkable to me is there was obviously different turning points in your life you mentioned you know 20 years later there was a turning point you mentioned that in uh, a website and videos which would be great to hear about in a second but what's remarkable is i think you you said early on as a teenager you were not going to be a victim you refuse to be refuse to be that person that teenage pregnant girl that was not going to be you and that's i mean that's that is that is remarkable there aren't that many people would have in your position would have taken that choice. What made you just decide, this is awful, it's not fair, it's not right, but I am not gonna be a victim. What made you make that choice? You know, I think um, the grace of God for sure. <laughs> um, you know, I, I was orphaned, but um, I was introduced to a God that cared to have a personal relationship with me. And so when you've been neglected your whole life and abused your whole life, and you are told that there is someone that wants to be in a healthy relationship with you, you're open to that. Mm -hmm. And I'm just really fortunate that it was the God of Christianity that introduced himself mm -hmm. to me and adopted me. And so I, I, even though I was orphaned in a real physical sense, I wasn't orphaned spiritually at that point. And so then I had someone to live for. And it wasn't about me. It wasn't about getting my vengeance or it wasn't about being right or it wasn't about being heard. You know, I think a lot of people, when something's been wrong, when they've experienced a wrong, they want to get out there and they want justice immediately. And they'll get out there even on social media and start crying out for justice. And all of us want justice. Um, but there, there, is, um, there is sometimes that we need to persevere in difficult seasons when no one else sees and no one else is patting us on the back for it before God gives us a microphone to share about it. Mm -hmm. And I think for, for over 25 years, the kindness of God shepherded me through multiple abandonments, ongoing abuse, and was just teaching me a new way, was teaching me a new normal and showing me that I didn't have to continue in that generational cycle that I was born into. And that's great news for all of us. None of us have to continue the wrongs that were done to us, um, the, the, the defeats that we've come from. I mean, none of us have to repeat that for the next generation. And that's largely on us. I mean, would you say maybe this is an obvious question that much as you had a courage and perseverance that there was maybe some divine help that, you know, but for God in your life, maybe even your teenage years and 20s might have been different. Yeah, you, I mean, you can't deny God's role, active role in my life. And, and that's what I love. I mean, I was always in public school settings. I have friends that do not share my faith, mm -hmm. but every single one of them to this day are like, mm -hmm. you're still the same person, Esther. You're still mm -hmm. talking about the same God. You're, mm -hmm. You still have stories of miracles of what he's doing and how he's providing for you. I mean, how can an orphan girl mm -hmm. go to two prestigious colleges and a leadership academy and graduate college debt-free? That's God. I mean, that's a provider. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's something that is a part of me. God is a part of my life and a part of my story. But man, I hope to invite others into that because I'm nothing special that he would have saved me and done that for me. He has mm -hmm. new life that he wants to give to all of us. And it's not something that we earn. I had nothing to give to him at 13 years old. I mean, it's, it's, it's his extravagant love for mankind that pursued me and I just, I can't help but live to say thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a message that people need to hear. I know without getting into, you know, all the detail, because this is about you, not me. Um, 
certainly I felt, as some of our listeners know, growing up in this large family media business, and uh, we'll talk about this later, certainly my name was, you know, Fairfax, not, you know, I didn't have my own name in a sense, which we'll get to later because I love that book title. But the sense that God loves me after the whole media debacle and the company going under, that was really the, the, the kernel of what helped me get through it. And a bit like you, although I've, I've gone through nearly what you've gone through, I have a pretty high perseverance. And um, just that sense of uh, God loves you and people let you down. Again, just to briefly cover some snippets, my dad was married three times. My mother was married twice. I was from the last married, marriage of each. And so much of where I grew up with the, the rich and the powerful, they didn't want to know you for who you were just because of your last name. So do people like me because of me or my name? And, uh, you know, I've not, never suffered abuse, but I have had close family members, you know, uh, say pretty awful things uh, to me that, you know, about my worth or lack of it. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I just can't imagine what, I mean, just I may have gone through like 0.1% of what you've gone through, but even the smallest percentage was, it's still pretty devastating. You go through a cycle of, you know, they sort of get on you about something and you defend yourself like it's not my fault. It's, it's but after about 20 minutes, you inevitably say, I'm sorry. Mm. Even though, you know, it wasn't your fault, but intellectually and the cycle continued. That's just yeah. a small fraction of what you went through. So I can't imagine it. But to me, that notion that God loves us, that's hope for everybody. That, that, that really helps us chart a new course when inevitably humans will always, well, a lot of the time, let us down. <laughs> well, absolutely. And Warwick, your pain is no less significant than my pain. I mean, pain is pain. And we all experience it. What's fascinating to me is that God never renames us in the middle of that crucible moment, he never renames us out of our sin, out of our lack. He never renames us out of what we've done wrong, what we're missing out of. God's names for us are always for the future and what he sees for us. And it's fascinating. There was an ancient woman. Um, her name is Ruth. And she had a mother-in-law. Her name is Naomi. And Naomi means sweet. The name means pleasant and sweet. And Naomi lost her husband and Ruth lost her husband. And this book is written. It's the book of Ruth. And it's a story of three widows actually, and how these widows overcome their crucible moments of losing their husband in ancient times when their husbands were their providers. Mm -hmm. And what's fascinating is that Naomi in the midst of her grief, she says, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara. And Mara means bitter. And Naomi was, looking at her circumstances and renaming herself. And that's what many of us are tempted to do. We're, we're, we're looking at the outside circumstance and we're saying, I'm a victim. I was wronged. You know, I'm bankrupt now. I'm divorced now. I'm an alcoholic. We're calling ourselves names based on our circumstances. And God never does that. And so I think that's what we have to do. It's not even just overcoming. It's, mm -hmm. it's pausing in that crucible moment and saying, wait a second, these circumstances are not my identity and they don't define me. And there is a new name that God has for me on the other side of this. And we have to persevere that there will be another side, that that hardship and that difficulty is not the, the end of our story. Absolutely. I'd love to hear more about this. One question I just want our listeners to just understand the story is, you said for 20 years, you were a successful class president from the sixth grade or something. It was just remarkable. Uh, but then you came to a point when, I think in your first book, you talk about no more faking fine. What changed when you decide, you know, I'm not going to just put on, you know, the church face, as some people say, or, hey, I'm good. It's all good. What changed for you where uh, maybe you opened up a bit? Something yeah. changed, I think, 20 years later for you. It did. And, you know, I wish it was my uh, spiritual maturity that led me down a path <laughs> of healing. Uh, it wasn't. It was, it was actually another crucible moment. And, um, and actually, thankfully, your friend Gary um, mm -hmm. was there when mm -hmm. I started going through it. Uh, my biological father, 20 years after that courtroom scene, reentered uh, my life and began stalking me. And um, I went through several years of very intense stalking, not knowing what his intentions 
were, but the notes I would receive and the threats were very credible. And he would show up at my workplace. He would show up at my home. And it was, it was like, I felt my life was unraveling. Like I couldn't suck it up anymore. I couldn't fake mm -hmm. fine anymore. Cause I wasn't fine. I mean, there was a credible threat to my safety that needed attention, but then what was, how was I emotionally supposed to walk through this? And then even how do I spiritually make sense of this? If I'm like being good, quote unquote, and trying to honor God and my life is falling apart. And, um, and so honestly, work. It was in the middle of a counseling session. And my counselor said to me, you need to lament. And I was like, why is he speaking another language? Like, well, I didn't even, <laughs> I didn't even know what. Lament. Right. And I, so right. I looked at him and I was like, I'm, I'm fine. Like, what do you, I'm yeah. fine. I'm doing really good. Look at my job. Look at my friends. Look at my, like, I'm fine. And he said, yeah. you need to lament. And I said, I, I don't even know what, I don't know what you right. just said to me. And so he described the word lament, which is a passionate expression of grief. And he said, you need to let it out. You need to grieve. You need to be upset. You need to be angry over yeah. what's happening. You need to be disappointed. And I just didn't even know that was allowed. And so it was, that was a big turning point for me to realize, you know, I never had parents to go to on my good days or my bad days. And so I didn't know how to go to God with my good and my bad. I thought God only wanted my strengths, only wanted my happy days. And so that kind of set me on a course of studying this language of lament. It's an ancient language. The Jewish people to this day are really good at lamenting and lamenting in community. And it was something that I just, I didn't know was missing. And it was missing not only from my everyday relationships, but it was missing from my Christianity but it's mm -hmm. not missing in the Bible. It's in every single chapter of the Bible. Mm -hmm. All of God's people have lamented mm -hmm. and all of us are going to lament. And so I'm not some super Christian to just suck mm -hmm. it up and fake fine. And that's when my life started to get on a different path of healing instead of performance. And I think that's such an important point for listeners to really understand is before you can move on, before you can even forgive, you have to understand, well, what is it I need to forgive exactly? What, you know, what's, what am I angry about? What's, um, you know, and it can take years again, just yeah. briefly for me, it was, you know, the loss of a 150 year old family business. I felt like I let my parents down. I felt like I let the founder of the company down who 150 years ago was an elder in his church, as strong as businessman for Christ has existed, wonderful father, um, wonderful husband, his employees loved him. He did everything right. It's like, as a believer, how in the world could that have happened? I let God down. I let, so there was years of grief, lament, and a lot of it was my fault, but certainly some of it wasn't. And you know, you've got to go through that. Yeah, lament is such a great term. Those years of of grieving to be able to then move on. I mean, as you know, stuffing it that's it's going to be an anxious going to hold you back you you know you can't move on unless you go through the unpleasant uh yeah. period of lamenting yeah and you know you and i probably have a lot of friends in boardrooms and leading mm -hmm. companies and they are expecting high performance from their mm -hmm. employees um, but what happens when their employee goes through a miscarriage or mm -hmm. goes through a divorce or is fighting alcoholism i mean there are so many of us that are walking around emotionally broken and we're trying to overcompensate in the business world, but we would be much better business leaders if we were emotionally healthy. And if we allowed our humanness, the fullness of who we are to, to just recognize we're going to have different feelings and different emotions in a given day. That's one thing right. that I will say Gary has been a great friend to me in is um, he let me be real and where I was at. And it was actually empowering. It actually made me want to work harder for him mm. because he let me be where I was at. And that's how God is. God doesn't say clean your mess up and then come to me. God says, just be where you're at and let me just walk with you in it. And I just think, man, I think there's companies that would be even more successful if we allowed time for our employees to lament. Yeah. I mean, let me yeah. jump in. Please, if ahead. I can jump in, let me jump in because what you guys have been talking about right now, I want to make sure the listeners really grasp what's happening here. We have two cases of crucibles in your lives, Warwick's case and Esther's case. And they're not exactly the same in terms of, of the details. Um, 
business failure, uh, personal tragedy and trauma. But if you listen to the emotions that come out of those experiences, you are both agreeing with each other about the emotional difficulty. And that's where I encourage listeners to focus on that, on that aspect of what we're talking about. It's not the details as much as it's the emotions. And listen to what Warwick and Esther are sharing here and apply that to your life because it can give you hope and it can lead to healing. One thing that's fascinating to me, um, I pulled uh, a sheet that your publisher, Esther, for uh, your new name, sent some quotes from the book. Warwick, I pulled one of your blogs uh, from the last couple of months. And just, I want the listeners and I want you both to listen to how similar you both, before you ever met, um, your situations are not the same, but listen to how similar your comments are. Esther, this is you talking about lament is not the end. Life can be weighty and you can feel stuck. While your circumstances may make you numb, I wrote this book with the great hope that you will know that God cares to make things right for you. God knows you, thinks of you, helps you, and rebuilds you so that you can endure. Discovering your new name is the next step forward after being in a season of lament. Warwick, a blog you wrote about your failure losing a $2.25 billion family media company after 150 years. You wrote this in that blog about faith. My faith in Christ is the anchor of my life. It has been since my days at Oxford University. During those dark years in the 1990s, after John Fairfax Limited fell out of family control and I moved to the U.S., I clung to my faith. Key concepts of my faith taught me, key concepts my faith taught me helped God loved me unconditionally. He does not need John Fairfax Limited. He does not need my accomplishment. God has a plan for my life, and I have to trust that and trust his purpose. You guys are speaking the same language from completely different perspectives. Well, and I would venture to say that, Warwick, you're probably a much more pleasant person to be around after all of that difficulty. I think you probably have a human relatable factor now that maybe wasn't there before. You probably have a higher degree of empathy for people that go through difficulty. You probably pay attention to people's needs in a different way. You relate to people on an emotional level. You have more emotional intelligence because of what you went through. And so that's what I would want the readers to know is that your crucible moment doesn't have to be the end of your story. It can really be a springboard to make you a person of more depth and more character and somebody that's actually able to be used by God. And I know he's using you. I hope he's using me. And um, I want to say you really are an inspiration, how you've persevered after your storm as well. Well, thank you. I mean, what's, I think, you know, remarkable as we're having this conversation is, you know, the power of vulnerability, the power of authenticity, you know, we don't want to work for people that are perfect because nobody's perfect mm -hmm. to have a leader that says, you know, I failed, you know, we're going to make mistakes. Uh, bad things are going to happen to us, but somebody that seems to be authentic. We live in a culture where uh, leaders, whether it's in business or politics, they never admit they fail. They double down. It's never my fault. In your situation is very different because obviously it wasn't your fault at all, but but they're not authentic, they're not vulnerable, they're not human. Who wants to follow some plastic leader, some yeah. thinking mm -hmm. fine person? I mean, it's, yeah. not, it's not real, you know? Um, so as you're real with others, it gives them the permission to be real. Yeah. They, they can be real. Um, so I, I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit more about the upcoming book, New Name, because I love that, that there was like a two minute video in which people you know, take off the old names or the old you know, t-shirts or the new name. So talk about, I think I understand No More Faking Fine, which I totally agree with. Talk about what led you to this whole new name concept that despite all our pain, somehow we can have a new name. Yeah, well, you know, after, um, after that No More Faking Fine season, I, I was, I was actually kind of surprised to survive uh, physically and emotionally and spiritually those stalking years. And yes. so, you know, after you go through difficulty, sometimes you, I mean, you, sometimes you really don't know if you're going to make it mm. through something. And mm -hmm. I was, I was surprised that I made it through and uh, I needed just a season for my faith to be rebuilt again, mm -hmm. because I, I was just, I'd been beat down for so many years and discouraged for so many years mm -hmm. and just, 
felt like I was hanging by a thread for so many years. And so what I discovered was that, um, there's a lot of new that God addresses in the Bible. You know, we hear about maybe a new Testament or we hear mm -hmm. about a new covenant. It says that God puts a new heart in us. There's, um, there's lots of new themes that are woven throughout the Bible. But one thing that I think is not touched on a lot is our new name. And I realized that there's a difference between labeling ourselves and naming ourselves. And I realized that in all of my crucible moments, I took on a label that was not supposed to stay with me. I took on the label of orphan. I took on the label of poor. I took on the label of broken and damaged goods and looked over and not good enough and a disappointment. And I took those on as my name. And I was walking around with these weights as if those were my identities. And again, God never named somebody out of their sin or out of their defeat. And so I just had to start saying to God, like, what do you call me? What does my name mean? What does Esther mean? I mean, I never felt like Esther was a very cool name being a young girl. You know, yes, it's like an old, it's an old, it's an old woman name is what I felt. <laughs> well, I realized that Esther means star. And I realized that there was an ancient woman named Esther who was very courageous and her courage led to, um, saving an entire, the entire Jewish race. And I thought, mm -hmm. man, if that Esther can be courageous, I want to be courageous like her. And so sometimes our new names are right in front of us. Our names have meaning to them, but sometimes God has a new name for us that when we get through that trial, it's part of our new identity. And I know Gary, I mean, you, you have a story too, don't you about a label that stuck with you? Indeed. Indeed, I do. Look at that, trying to turn the tables on them. <laughs> well, it was because, because when I was researching for this book, I started asking, you right. know, am I the only one that had a label right. that I've right. struggled with? And sure enough, I mean, hundreds of people wrote to me, these are the labels that I'm believing about myself. And none of those labels are what God would have called them. Right. And I would, uh, you know, this is a good time to bring up Warwick, I think, um, you may not have had, I mean, you had heir, right? That was the, mm -hmm. you were the heir to the family dynasty. But mm -hmm. one of the things, very literally, it wasn't a name that was attached to you, but after that happened and the press that came after the, the failure of the takeover bid and the loss of two point, you know, uh, $2.5 billion and losing what your great-great-grandfather started, just having the name Fairfax mm -hmm. in Australia that was difficult, wasn't it? It was. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, as an individual, uh, I didn't have any meaning, uh, meaningless. I was, you know, the uh, heir apparent, if you will, which my parents' perspective to Fairfax Media. So my only role in life was to fulfill a role. So who I was as an individual, my desires, my wants, my goals, were meaningless. So the only name I had was not individual. It was just a not. It was a Fairfax heir. So when that um, went under, it's almost I think in the terms of talking about. Well, I, I had no name mm. because my you know it was Fairfax, and you know ironically I have um, uh, older sister and a younger sister, and um, you know when they got married they were happy to lose the Fairfax name, <laughs> you know, yeah. they didn't hyphenate. I'm not against hyphenating, but for them, the last thing they wanted is Fairfax in their name. So it's like, yeah. hooray, I don't have to use my last, my maiden name anymore. Hooray, you know, they couldn't wait to get rid of it, you know, mm -hmm. in one sense, because a, being a Fairfax, you have all these, you know, notions of privilege and the rest. Well, as a guy, I can't, I couldn't really do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I was stuck with Fairfax. Fortunately, I married an American girl. We've lived here since the early 90s, so the, the name Fairfax is meaningless here, by and large. So that was a wonderful gift. But trying to separate myself from that and, you know, again, back in terms of the notions of name, you know, people in the 90s would say, well, you know, Warwick's kind of broken. I don't know if he'll ever amount to anything. And so gradually, and I shared this in an earlier blog, and. Um, Earlier podcast, as I began to find things I was good at, my self esteem slowly reclaimed itself, and you know, was on a few nonprofit boards, including church board, and 
coaching and writing a book and all, you know, gradually I began to feel like I did have some worth and hence maybe my name meant something other than you watch for me. And you know, if you Google me, you know, I have a Wikipedia entry that Google is not particularly favorable. So you mean, it's like, you know, young, hot-headed kid could have had it all, could have had it all but blew it in the, in the takeover. Mm. So, you know, your name isn't what Google says it is either. Yes, so it's most not. Most of us don't have Google entries, but that's unfortunately <laughs> I do. So yeah, long-winded good. way of saying, I totally love that concept for new name. So what's your vision for, for, for this book? And what is your hope and desire, if you will, of how God would use this? Yeah, I would love for a reader to, um, you know, have some healthy self-reflection time. Sounds like you've had years of it. Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and you, you know, you can identify a, a label yeah. like meaningless and you yeah. can throw it aside and you can say, that's not who God says I am. And you can now say, you know what, I'm going to live life on purpose and I'm going to encourage others to live with meaning and purpose. And you're doing that. You're so you're an example of somebody that I would love for, I'd love for somebody to pick up a book and follow in your footsteps. And I'd love for them to identify those labels, throw them aside and listen to the new name that God has for them. Well, what's encouraging is you're, you've been married. How long have you been married? It'll now? be three years this month, actually. So, so I, I, I know <laughs> you say this, but in a sense you have Somewhat of a new name there too, right? And yes, I do. And name. actually, did you go to Oxford? Did I hear that correct? I did, I did. Because that's where my husband and I met, actually. Really? <laughs> we met at that's Oxford right. University. We were in our 30s and we had both left careers that we loved. People okay. thought we were crazy. Yeah. And we went to study at, um, at Wycliffe Hall yeah. there at Oxford University. And our, our classes overlapped. And one of my uh, spiritual dads actually... Uh, introduced us and we began dating and uh, it was the best semester of my life. <laughs> so. Well, that's probably uh, a whole nother story, but uh, Gary may have alluded to, I came to my faith in Christ at an evangelical Anglican church at Oxford, St. Old Dates. I don't know if you ever visited when and you were there. That's where we went to church. We no. went to St. Old Dates. No way. <laughs> that yes. is fabulous. Yes, we did. Oh, that is fabulous. <laughs> now, th this he was probably not there, but a guy by the name of Michael Green was rector when I was there, but he probably wasn't there. That when. sure sounds familiar. And I bet Joel, yeah. so my husband did a whole year program there. Um, and so my husband might know. Oh, I, wow. did a, I did a short intensive business program and our courses overlapped at Wycliffe. Wow. That, um, that is... Yeah, it was, it was a wonderful place to meet. It was very romantic to date in Oxford. <laughs> but, but you know, what I love about your story is um, that you don't have kids yet, do you? We actually have a, a 15 month old that I'm six Oh, you months, do? Yeah, I'm six months pregnant with our oh. second. <laughs> What's exciting to me is um, you have the opportunity to chart a new course. Amen. With your husband and your children. Yes. Now, in my case, obviously, a little further down the road, I've been married to my wife 30 years, actually, this year. <laughs> and we have three kids in their 20s. And, you know, I didn't have a horrific upbringing, but certainly not. You know, we're not perfect, but, you know, they, um, they have no clue what it is to live, you know, sort of a broken family. They don't understand it. So yeah. when they go back to Australia, which for me, mm -hmm. it's kind of painful, um, they don't they just see it's a wonderful place and family and all but um you know it's just it's just so different yeah. you know that with our kids and we can set new traditions you know one yes. of the things we do in our family and birthdays we go around the table youngest to oldest and say what do you most love and admire about the person whose birthday it is i love that and some of us are writers my daughter who's just come back from two years in australia is incredibly eloquent has a strong faith so you know you go around and it's just amazing any problem with that is when it's your turn and it's your birthday <laughs> it's like <laughs> oh boy <laughs> you know, oh. Hey back. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> okay enough we're ready please stop <laughs> <laughs> but my point is your family is young but you have a chance to have set new traditions and your kids will have new names they won't go yeah. through mm -hmm. what you went through yeah so that is you have a chance to set a different course for generations in your family, which I think Thank is, you. it's a miracle. To me. I, it is a miracle. And I think, you know, to the listeners, you're never too old to have a new start. It's mm -hmm. just, it's never been too late. It's never been too bad. 
You've never screwed up things too much. Like God is in the business of making us new constantly. Even when we're in our seventies and eighties, if we make it that long, he's going to be making us new and it's never too late to chart a new course. And so I, I love, love that you've I, done that. You've inspired and, me. And I love what you, you say. Well, I think imply that God loves us. We're not unlovable. We're beautiful and lovable in his sight. Nobody okay. else may see that, but he does. Yes. I know that's part of your message, which I love that message that you have. Well, um, thank you. Thank you. And both of you have clearly um, spent some time uh, talking with me about the concept of landing the plane, bringing the conversation <laughs> around full circle, um, because we're at the point now where, I mean, those are really resonant statements to leave um, our listeners with. Esther, um, tell our listeners where they can find out more about you and about your book. Sure. Uh, my new, speaking of new, website will be <laughs> Esther Fleece Allen. I f wrote my first book, No More Faking Fine, under my name, Esther Fleece, because I wasn't married. But um, then I went to Oxford, as we just talked about, met my wonderful <laughs> husband and became Esther Allen. So my next book is Esther Fleece Allen. And that's um, E-N at the end of Allen, not A. Allen, yes. And it's E-S-T-H-E-R yep. Fleece. Mm -hmm. Alan. And then uh, the, the website for the book is yournewnamebook.com. And there's places that you can order it. Books will be available wherever um, books are sold. And I would love your listener support. It would mean a great deal. And that comes out in January, correct? It does. Yes. January 14th, 2020. And then I'm having our second baby, Lord willing, in February. So pray for me. Wow, that is <laughs> that's amazing. Well, I want our listeners to go out and get that book. Uh, new name. I mean, we, we all have to understand the concept that we do have a new name. And for those of faith, you know, God gives us um, that new name. We can shake off the old and it's, um, you know, we may not feel lovable, but, you know, um, if we're blessed, we might have some friends and family that love us. Some of it, usually we have at least one or two, it may not be many, uh, but ultimately God loves us and just that concept of new name is so important. So I think our listener could get tremendous value out of that, irrespective of what faith tradition they come out of. It's such an important concept. And thank you for the legacy of your life and your courage and your willingness to be vulnerable because as you're vulnerable, it gives other people the permission to say, you know what, maybe it's okay if I'm vulnerable. Yeah. Maybe if, if Esther can get over what she's been through, maybe I can. Yeah. Because, you know, it gives people hope. So that's yeah. part of the point of sharing. Yes. It gives people hope. Thank well, you. Thank you, listeners, for spending time with us. Thank you, Esther Fleece Allen. It's going to take me a while to get used to all three names now, but <laughs> I got them right. Thank you, Esther and Warwick, uh, for such, a, such an insightful conversation. And again, uh, it, it's our hope uh, that you who are listening in can pull something out of this, even if your circumstances are completely different than Esther's, completely different than Warwick's. Emotionally, um, we hope that you've connected with something there. And uh, at Crucible Leadership, you can continue to connect with us at our website, crucibleleadership.com. Warwick writes a blog every couple of weeks where he unpacks some of the very things we talked about here today. Uh, you can also engage us on social media, Warwick, and I know Esther's a big fan of social media. You can engage us <laughs> on social media at, on Facebook at Crucible Leadership. Uh, you can engage us on uh, LinkedIn at Warwick Fairfax, and that is Warwick with the silent W in the middle, W-A-R-W-I-C-K at Warwick Fairfax. And until the next time we're together, um, uh, thank you for joining us with at uh, Beyond the Crucible um, where we like to discuss crucible moments as not the end of your story that is the beginning. As Esther has proven, as Warwick has proven, and so many of you have proven, it's not the end of your story at crucible. It's the beginning of a new chapter in your story that can lead to the greatest time of your life because it points you toward a life of significance.